everybody. This is Lauren Hershey. I'm the senior pastor at Word of Life Church. And we hope this podcast blesses you and helps bring you closer to God. Enjoy today's message. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5 as we finish up 1 John today. And let's feed on God's Word. We're finishing 1 John. We're starting a book for that we're reading as a church. Next month, we're reading the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, and so starting this afternoon and going on into the Christmas season, we'll be reading the Gospel of Luke, and I'll be sending out a little video this week, uh, a little synopsis of of Luke and how it's distinctive from the other four Gospels, and uh, it'll be a great book. I thank God for leading us to read the Gospel of Luke here in December at the Christmas season. Okay, so 1 John chapter 5, let me say it this way, Uh, you know, Smith Wigglesworth was a great man of God, and he would always carry a New Testament in his pocket. And whenever he went out to eat with people, he would always push back from the table after they ate, and he would say, now we fed our bodies, let's feed our spirits. And they'd start to read the Word of God. And so this morning, let's come and feed on the Word. Let's open our hearts and receive. How many believe that God's Word is alive and His Spirit's here, and He knows you're here? And he's ready to give you something that will make it worthwhile for you to be in church today. Amen. Can you pray with me? Father, thank you for your anointing, for utterance. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 5, we're going to work our way down through here. 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Everyone that believes that Jesus is a Christ, whether he's Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Catholic, non-denominational, this is the great unity verse. Everyone. Can you say everyone? Everyone, there's a lot of fine points upon which we can find disagreement. But we need to understand there are brothers and sisters. Amen? Now, like one person said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, charity. So whosoever, can you say whosoever, is born of Christ. Hallelujah. Let's go on. And he loves him who's begotten of him. Say it right. Can we say whoever believes Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and loves the other brothers and sisters? And that means me. Why don't you smile your neighbor and tell him that means me. Now, by this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And his, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For a believer, God's word to us is not a heavy burden to be born. God's word gives us life. Thank you for that amen. Amen. If you want to join my fan club with Terry, Terry and I are enjoying the word of God together. (laughs) How many of you you ever had the word of God speak to your heart and set your feet a-dancing because of what God did? Amen. His commands are not burdensome. They're life-giving. I know our flesh doesn't like that, and we have to grow and get our minds around that. But how many of you have grown enough to recognize that God's way is best? And what what he's leading you to do is a joy for you. It's going to be for your good. Can I get an amen? So his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever, here's why, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. It's the world... The cosmos, the, not the, the, the earth, but the world, a system of practices and influences and temptations that are in this world around us, but war against the things of God. It's a demonic disorder that opposes God's order. And God is a God of order. He's a God of peace and joy and love. But there's a system of temptation and and things in this world. But Jesus said, we're not of this world. We're in this world. But he said in John 17, they are not of this world even as I am not of this world. How many believe that Jesus is not part of Satan's kingdom? 
even when he was walking here. How many believe he was not a part of Satan's kingdom, even though he's walking in this this devil-infested place? Well, how many of you can believe that in the same way that Jesus was not a part of this Satan's kingdom, neither are you. Neither are you, because of your faith in Christ, you got lifted out. I know the movie The Matrix is an old movie now, but you ought to go back and watch part of it enough just to see the the thought that people can be plugged in and then unplugged from a system of mind control. Because every one of us, Pre-Christ, we were plugged into the devil's kingdom. Oh, but thank God when you said Jesus is Lord, he pulled that quarter-inch plug out of the back of your head, so to speak, and ah, I see things differently. Come on. How many of you give pastor a break? Say, that's a good illustration, pastor. Now, Matrix Reloaded, I don't know. I've watched that a couple times. I still can't figure it out. But the first one, the first one, it's just like the Karate Kid. The first one is the good one. Amen. It's that way with Joyce cooking. She is a great experimenter. And, you know, when I go out to eat, yeah, this has nothing to do with the message. I mean, we shouldn't even take time to do this. We won't take time to do that. But I guess I need to finish the story. I am, I am a food adventurer when we go out to eat. I'll try almost anything. But at home, don't mess with it. You made it this way. It was great. Why are you thinking you got to change something? Amen. But Christ shows up in Pastor Lauren, and we've been married for 51 years. So, And you can tell by looking at me, I'm not short on anything to eat. So, wow. This is the victory that overcomes the world, these influences around about us. What? Our faith. Our faith, the moment we confess Jesus as Lord, believe it in our heart that God raised him from the dead, man, we get translated out of the devil's kingdom, Right? And into God's kingdom. Whoever believes, who is he that overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And then it goes on to talk about God's testimony about his Son and the witnesses. That the word of God, the blood of Jesus he shed on the cross, and the Spirit of God all agree that Jesus is our deliverer. Can I get an amen? Amen. And the Father, the Word in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, they bear witness. Praise God. And if we receive, look at verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, you know, if, if someone is testifying or, oh, how many of you are like me? When you go shopping on the Internet, you want to see the reviews. I mean, I buy as much, I buy more off the reviews than I do off the product description especially the ones you can see from a foreign country because their grammar is not right. You know, but how they... You know, I ordered a raised garden bed. And when it got here, it was cheap sunglasses. (laughs) I tracked that all the way from China. And it said it showed up. I knew something was wrong when the box was only this big. I'm raising little mini plants <laughs> going right along. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. Can I get an amen? And this is the witness of God, that, that he's testified of his son. And he who believes in the son of God, look at this, has the witness in himself. That's such a key for being led by the Spirit of God. The the witness on the inside of us is what guides us. Not God, if you don't want me to do this, you stop me. Come on. You've got a will, and you can override what God wants. You know, and you may be saying, oh, God, stop me, because you know full well you shouldn't be going that way but you want him to control you like a horse or a mule with a bit and a bridle. 
In the Psalm 32, he said, don't be like that. He wants to teach you and have you follow that witness on the inside. He does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he's not believed the testimony that God's given of his son. You know, if you, if you don't believe God, you're making God out to be a liar. Now, notice the testimony. Verse 11, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Can you say hallelujah? And it's not just a forever life, but it's a different quality of life. It's a new life. It's, it's something that never existed before. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the, the author writes to us, God says to us, if any person is in union with Christ, he's a new creation. A new creation, something that never existed before. Now, I know that, you know, they talk about jailhouse religion. They talk about getting religious or turning over a new leaf. I know that's a possibility. Uh, people can just not change, but they can, you know, make a different, make a decision to, well, I'm just going to be different, but not come into contact with God. But I'm telling you, when you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that he's the son of God and he gave his life for you and God raised him from the dead on the third day and made him Lord and he's coming again and you from your heart turn from the sin in your life and you say, Jesus is Lord. Woo! Something, bam, happens on... out. <laughs> Something happens on the inside of you and life comes where death used to be. And suddenly, and it starts a process where you don't want to sing the songs you sang before. You don't tell the jokes that you told before. You don't want to read the books that you read before. You don't want to hang out with the people doing the same things that they used to do, you used to do. Can I get an amen, church? And why is that? It's not just because you turned over a new leaf. It's because you became something new to the point where if someone sees you years later that never saw you in the meantime, they might even say, what happened to you? You're not even the same person you used to be. And they're right because that old you died. And now really, really, it's Christ in you. It's Christ Jesus living his life in you. Oh, hallelujah. He who had the son, look at this. This is God's testimony that God's given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son, I'm telling you, this is shouting ground verses, folks. He who has the son has life. Woo, hallelujah. Everybody glad about that. It doesn't say anything about whether you feel like it or not or anybody agrees with you or not. Say it with me. I have Jesus. I have eternal life. Right now. Oh, hallelujah. See, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven. You don't have to wait till this physical house you live in ceases to function. You're out of here to get eternal life. Say it with me. I have eternal life right now. Man, it's like, a, it's like a holy radioactivity on the inside of you that you can yield to that, and, and it will automatically lift you above those worldly temptations. I remember uh, reading about a, a missionary who went to a, a people group, and they heard in the heard the stories from that people group, and that people group worshipped a wicked God, small g, deity, small d, that was evil and wicked and hurtful. And they knew, but they knew there was a more supreme God who was benevolent, who was loving and kind and good, and who wouldn't, wasn't asking to exact things from them and sacrifice their children. They knew there was a benevolent, good God. But when the missionary asked him, well, why do you worship this evil one when you know there is this good one? And they said, because we don't have enough of a relationship with this good one to be done with the evil one. But I'm telling you, the moment you confess Jesus as Lord, you got into a relationship with the good one. Hallelujah. And you're done. You could be done with the evil one and all his stuff. Amen? 
You have, say it with me one more time, I have eternal life right now. Now, here's verse 13. John, the author, and we've spent four weeks now reading and, and talking from 1 John. John says, these things I've written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God. How many could raise your hand and say, that's me. I believe in the name of the Son of God. Well, then he's written this to you. Well, he's written it. Why has he written it? That you may know that you have eternal life. He wrote these things so you can know that you have it right now. Man, that settles a lot of stuff. Well, I sure hope when I leave this world, I'm going to get eternal life, that I'm going to make it in with God. No, you're already in with God. Amen. You already started your eternity with God the moment you confess Jesus as Lord. Hallelujah. I think in some ways when we leave this world, we're going to get over into the next realm and think, well, this feels familiar. Why? Because when we praise like we were a few minutes ago, Jesus shows up. We're in the very presence of God. I know it's going to be more intense. I know we're going to be out of these fleshly bodies because if we got in his presence now, we'd explode. I mean, these things just could not handle it. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, that's why we speak in tongues sometimes, right? I mean, just my, my head words just don't get it. I just can't get where I want to go and say what I want to say with my mind. My spirit wants to express to God. But you already have that eternal life right now. He said, I write these things. I've written this to you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God now. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. And I want to challenge you this morning. Don't don't let experience, don't let doubt and, and, and what you've seen and what you've thought and what others might say rob you of the reality of those two verses. The truth is, this is the confidence we have of him. Now, we've got eternal life right now, and this is the confidence that we have concerning God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How many can agree with that? And And it goes right on to say, and if we know he hears us, you know, so many court cases happening in the last couple of years were thrown out of court by the judge saying these plaintiffs don't have a standing to bring this suit. They don't have a standing. So they're not in a position to, to come and speak to me about this issue at all. It doesn't really matter what the rest of the issue is or the facts or anything. I'm just not going to hear it. But we know that if we pray according to the will of God, we come with adequate standing and he hears it. And if we know he hears it, we know we have the petition that we ask for. We know it. Say we know it. Glory to God. He spent four and a half chapters bringing us to this point to assure your hearts of your standing with God that you've got life right now, that you're right with God right now. And now he says, and don't stop there because the whole point was not just to bring your heart confidence there. The point is also for you to go beyond that point of now having confidence and open up your mouth and pray on behalf of other believers so that they get through all the way to the end. Don't just be a consumer. Don't just be a candle with a wick and matches on the table. Light that sucker. Come on. Let the light shine. Woo. Come on. Let's do something. Let's move something. Matthew 21, 22, Jesus said a similar thing. He said, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Oh, glory to God. 
Mark 11, verse 24. He said, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you'll have them. Woo, I know. I know it takes faith. I know it's a challenge to us. In other words, if you're a horseman you got a, and you ask God for a saddle and you believe it's his will for you to get a saddle, you got to believe you have that saddle. When other people ask you, I want to see your saddle. Well, you can't see it yet. I thought you said you had a saddle. I have a saddle. Well, can, when, can, can I see it? No, you can't see it. Well, what is it, an invisible saddle? No, you just can't see it yet. Well, I thought you said you have a saddle. I have a saddle. Amen, Amen. Amen. I have it. Well, I thought you said it was God's will for you to get married and have a husband. It is. And I thought you said you asked and God gave you a husband. He did. I did and he did. Well, let me meet him. Well, you can't. Well, why not? Well, he's not here yet. Well, I thought you said you have him. I have him. Oh, and he's a good-looking dude, and I pray for him all the time. And, man, I'm looking forward. I'm getting my dress. Woo, hallelujah, and I'm watching my weight, and I'm learning how to be a good wife to him. Hallelujah, because I got me a man. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's look at the next verse. So he says, "What? oh, Hallelujah. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he, God, will give the one praying, will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there's sin not leading to death. Notice what he's saying. He said, this is the confidence. We've spent four and a half chapters, four weeks, come to the point where we're confident. What are we confident of? That if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have it. And this is the prayer he wants us to pray, that if you see a brother sinning a sin that doesn't lead to death, you pray and God will hear your prayer because you have standing with him and you know it's his will and God will deliver life from heaven to that one in sin. Glory be to God. He doesn't want us to stand back. Oh, man, that's too bad. He's really messing up. I wish somebody would do something. I wish somebody would do something too. And who's the somebody? You and me. Hallelujah. How are we going to know God hears us? Well, he said right here, it's his will. It's his will for us to not go through life just passively or being victims and watching our loved ones and our friends and other believers that start out believing in Christ fall away or get snared and caught up in junk. Are you with me? It's God's will that we make power available and that we, when we pray, we receive it. We believe we receive it even when we don't see it yet. And when someone starts to talk about, well, you know, so-and-so, he's just living in sin, he's just messing up. No, we don't get on that wagon. Why? Because we know something else. We know the rest of the story. We know we have prayed. And God's granted life for him. What's that mean? How do we pray? It's not that hard. Okay, it's, let's keep it simple. Let's keep it simple. God said, Pray, and God give him life. Father, you said pray, I'm praying, give him life. That's pretty simple, right? If we want to elaborate a little bit, Lord, send labors across his path. Send influences in, into his life that he'll listen to. Some, someone that through whom, some things, Father, something through or someone's through whom you can minister to him that will reach his heart, that will penetrate the blindness of his mind. But you said, Lord, you said, and it's your will, and you brought my heart to this place of confidence. And so I'm praying this prayer, Lord, because you told me to. And I'm in the courtroom of heaven right now, and I've got standing because you gave me standing. And I'm asking you according to your will so I know you're hearing me. Man, and all of a sudden it starts. This deal is fixed. Yeah. On the cross. 
when Jesus said it's finished. God loves these people. John 3, 16, God loves the world enough to send Jesus for them. Not the world, the satanic system that wars against him, but the people in the world. And we're no longer part of the world. And blessed be God, we don't have to sit back and wonder if these people are going to end up receiving Jesus and then going to hell in a handbasket or living in hell in their life. We can do something about it. We can help them with our prayers. Amen. Amen. We pray for those who sin a sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. But let's not get hung up on what that is. That's a huge study if you want to get into it. But John didn't get into it. He didn't make a big deal about it. The big deal here in this book, he says, yeah, there is this, there is that. Pray for this. Let's move on. Amen. I'll tell you this, the sin leading to death is not suicide. Right. It's not suicide. Some people thought it would be. But in the book of Acts, chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira come in, and they lie to the Holy Spirit, and they're dead. They fall down dead. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul warns us to not receive communion dishonorably. He said, for this reason, people have gotten sickly and died early. See, there are consequences to things. There are consequences to things. I remember Kenneth Hagin telling about a man he went to pray for. The man was 39 years old, and, and Brother Hagin went to pray for him, and he said God spoke to him and said, don't pray for him. He's going to die. And then he said this, the Lord said this, spiritual laws have been set in motion, and they cannot be reversed. Later on in talking with the family, Brother Hagen found out the family was all acknowledging that he has said just all his life, he said, I'll never make it to 40. I'll be dead before 40. So in this whole book, he's been talking about this group of people who deny the Father and the Son, who deny the deity of Christ, who have made their choice. He said in one place, they were among us, but they left to show that they were, even though they were with us, they were not of us. So what he's talking about is that group of people who, he, who God has turned over to destruction. We don't want people to get there. But as you look through the book, uh, look through the Bible, you'll find there are times when God start, stops dealing with people. Not because he doesn't care, not because he doesn't want them to be saved, but because they don't want to be saved. They don't want to walk with God. They deliberately chose to turn their back on God. Well, let's go on. But that's a huge difference, folks, between somebody, a brother or sister. And just notice in that verse, he says at the start of it, he said, if you see a brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask. And then the second part of the verse, he doesn't use that terminology of brother. So if you see a brother or sister sinning, what do we do? Oh, glory be to God. You're not with, you remember the, Paul saying to Timothy, God's not given us, a, for God's not given us a spirit of timidity, but of what? Power. Say it with me. I'm not powerless in these situations. Oh, glory to God. I'm not powerless. You're not powerless. Come on, crank on the generator. Crank it up. Get plugged in. Get that power stirred up. Get into the throne room of God and ask life. Ask for life. Are you with me this morning? How many can see from the Word of God what I'm saying is true? Now, don't just believe it because I say it, but if you see it in the Scriptures, let's act on it. Amen. Amen. Oh, glory be to God. I want you to look with, before we do that, though, look at the last, let's, let's read on. Verse 18, we know that whoever's born of God does not sin, but he who's born of God keeps himself, and that wicked one doesn't touch him. Say it with me, I'm a believer. Christ Jesus, the Holy One, lives in me, and he keeps me. And though I might be tempted... And I might sin. It's not a fatal thing. And it's not a habitual thing. 
and I don't want to do it, and I turn from it because Jesus is keeping me from the inside out. Oh, glory to God. You know who's most miserable in this world? A Christian living in sin. I mean, before we received Jesus, we just sinned like it was normal and enjoyed it. Amen. And we won't talk about those things we did because they're shameful. But if you get born again and then you go back and try to live that lifestyle you lived before you were a Christian, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be about as healthy and happy as that goldfish. That goldfish looked at the birds flying around, looked at the cats and the dogs, and then looked at the bowl that he was in and was miserable being in a stinking bowl. And so he go, ate his goldfish food. He did his goldfish calisthenics. He built up his goldfish muscles. He swam his goldfish laps. And one day, one day that goldfish, just like the guy, just like Tom Hanks in, in Castaway, one day he got his raft down. No, he didn't have a raft. Goldfish didn't have a raft. He had a tail. He got up his momentum and got going, and he headed toward the surface, and with a big, a big swipe of that strengthened goldfish tail, he flew up out of the water and over the edge of the bowl, crying out, I'm free. You heard me mention the cat, right? See, fish are meant to live in water. He'd have to become a new creation to live out in the air. Well, you were living in a sea of sin, and you became a new creation. Oh, glory to God. You can't live in that old environment anymore and be happy. Woo, glory to God. Now, look at verse 19. We know that we're of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come. Do you know this? And has given us an understanding. Do you know he's come? Has, do you, has he given you an understanding that you might know him? Come on, this is not a trick quiz. Has God given you understanding from his spirit that you could know him better? Yeah. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. This is it, and eternal life. This is it. Oh, glory be to God. Doesn't matter what the heretics say. And then finally he says this, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from anything other than that directed by God's revealed will, anything that would try to take its place. Come on, church. Keep yourselves from it. Why? Because you've got the capacity. On the inside. You've gotten to know that greater, holy, strong, good one. And as you draw close to him, man, his strength gets strengthened on the inside of you. You know, like, you know, like the old expression used to say, like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. Man, the closer you get to dad, the more you're going to be like him. How many of you ever had this experience? Like I was shopping. Some of these department stores, you know, have their columns and they're covered with mirrors. Some of them were like a couple feet wide in some stores. I was Now, my dad died about 13 years ago. But here in the last year, I went walking by one of those columns and caught a glimpse of my dad in the mirror. <laughs> oh, it was me. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're going to end up looking like him. Amen. You're going to look like him. You hang out with your heavenly father, you can't help but be transformed into his image. Now, you ready for some shouting ground? Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7 with me. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, as we wrap this up, I just want you to understand, when we're talking about prayer, I just want you to understand this is an easy thing. This is not something, oh, glory. In 2 Samuel 7, the prophet Nathan was talking with, Sam, with, with David. And David was, King David was sharing with the prophet his desire to build a house for God. And so the prophet Nathan said, do it all, do all, whatever's in your heart, do it. 
This is a good example of realizing that not everything in our heart is from God. Our heart can be wicked and deceitful. So the prophet said, go ahead and do it. Now, how many think you get the word of the prophet? It's pretty good stuff. Pretty, I mean, he's a proven prophet. But the prophet left the room, and God spoke to the prophet and said, I never told him that. Never in all these years of traveling in the wilderness, being with my people in the wilderness, never have I said to them, have I ever said to them, build me a house? You go back and you tell David that he's not going to build me a house. His son is going to build me a house. But then you also tell him this. Not only is he going to build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. That's what God said to David. I'm going to build you a legacy, a household. Verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and your rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, and I will come from your body, and who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and if he he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him. But my mercy, verse 15, shall not depart from him. And your house, verse 16, and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Then King David So according to these words and according to all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. And then look at what King David did. King David went in and sat before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you brought me thus this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O Lord God. And you have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? I'm reading this. We're going over this because, it, because I want to reinforce and water that seed from 1 John that this is the confidence that we have concerning him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have it. And the pressure's on him. And the grace is ours. And the receiving is easy. He's got the heavy lifting. He's the one bringing life to our loved ones. All we do is take him at his word and simply receive it. All those wonderful benefits that Jesus provided of forgiveness, even healing. Regardless, and I just want to say this to you as we come here, as we finish up this morning. I want you to forget about how many times you may have been prayed for healing. How many times you talk to the Lord about it? And as we look at how David responded when God spoke to him, I just want to encourage you to respond simply to what God said in Isaiah 53, verse 4. That surely Jesus has borne our sicknesses and carried our diseases. He's done it. And just as simply as David responds to this word, I just want you to just simply receive what God's provided. Look at what David did. Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Verse 19. Verse 20. Now what more can I say to you? For you, Lord God, know your servant. You know me. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, you've done all these great things to make your servant, to make me know them. Therefore, you are great. Now, I like this because this whole section is called David's Thanksgiving to God. What's the Lord spoken of you? Man, we can simply receive it and be glad. Just take it. For your word's sake and according to your own heart, David's saying this to God, you've done all these great things to make your servant, to make me know them. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God. There's none like you, nor, there is, nor there, is there any God beside you, according to all that we've heard with our ears. And who is like your people, like Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land before your people, 
whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, the nation and their gods. For you have made your people, Israel, your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. Listen, and now God has made his church his people. God's made you his people. And he is your God. He's taken it upon himself. People say, well, I found the Lord. Listen, you came to the Lord because he found you. (laughs) And you simply responded, right? Oh, my. Look at verse 24. For you've made your people Israel your very own people forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. Now look how he responds. Verse 25. Now, O Lord God, the words which you've spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as you've said. Just receive it. Just receive it. Don't, don't worry about having, figuring out how it's going to manifest. That's on his end. Just stay open. Say, <laughs> so, Lord, I, just, I receive it. Can, can we get the keys? Hallelujah. I'd just like to take a moment right now and do business with God. Hallelujah. Jesus provided blessing for you. He provided forgiveness. He provided grace. He provided healing. He provided restoration. Hallelujah. He provided all these wonderful things. He reached out to us, right? So right now, as the keyboard begins to play, the music begins to play, I'd just like you to close your eyes, maybe reach up your hands to the Lord, reach out your heart to him, and just simply receive. Just simply receive. And Father, I thank you right now for your power and your glory in this room. Father, I thank you for touching these hearts. You love each one so much, so much. Lord, we're coming. Just like David did. This was your plan. Never before heard of a person having God, having you say something like this. But then you said it. And he's found it in his heart. And we find it in our hearts. Lord, that which you've spoken to us, that which you've spoken to me, Establish it and do as you've said. And Father, I thank you for healing. I open my heart, Lord. And I thank you for touching my body, my mind, my soul, touching my marriage, my finances, and touching these loved ones that we lift up to you right now. Give them life, Father. Thank you for laborers crossing their paths. You know the hurts and wounds of their hearts that are stand as, that they hold on to as, and put up as walls and, and shields against you and against your love. But you're greater than all those things. Your word is greater. Your love is greater. The redemption, the blood of Jesus shed for them is greater. So we simply plead for them on your behalf and their behalf. We come as you've told us to do, Father. Give them life. And we receive it. Right here as we're praying, we've received it. So, Father, they're in your hands. Now this whole operation is in your hands. And we see them with the eyes of hope and hearts of love. And thank you that the day will be manifested when we'll rejoice with them, their restoration. Thank you, Lord, for strengthening them within by your spirit, with the power to win, by your spirit ruling their inner life. Thank you for opening the eyes of their understanding, enlightening them to see things accurately and to embrace things that are excellent. Like the prodigal son, Father. 
Thank you for them coming to themselves and coming home to your house. And Father, with this holiday coming up on Thursday, we thank you for your many blessings. You've been so good to us. And that's not going to change, but we pause to reflect on your goodness and what you've done for us this year and throughout our life. You've been faithful. So of our time, our talents, our reflection, our thanks, you're worthy of it all. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for their love. I thank you for the fun and the privilege of being in a church together with them. Be glorified. Continue to be glorified in all of us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like every head to ever bow to every eye closed. If you're here today, you say, Pastor, I, I believe what you've said about Jesus, but I don't know that I have any at any one moment actually made that my own and made him Lord of my life. But I want to do that right now. I want to turn from the world and sinful ways, and I want to make... I want to receive Jesus as Lord. We're going to pray a prayer in just a moment. We're all going to pray together. But if that's you, I'm talking to you right now, and you're praying with me to receive Jesus for the first time, I'd really like to know that I'm praying with you, have that privilege of knowing that. So on the count of three, would you raise your hand? And then we're going to pray together. Say, I'm receiving Jesus right now. One, two, Three. Go ahead and slip your hand. And we say, well, I see that. Thank you. Thank you. If you're thinking, well, why do I need to do that? Well, the scripture says that he is the mediator. Jesus is the only mediator between God and men. So without the Lord Jesus, you're kind of out of luck as far as getting res- reconciled to God. So let me count to three one more time. And see if you'll join this one. One, two, three. Three, Lord, I'm receiving you. All right, church, let's pray this together. Say it with me. Dear God in heaven, right now, I turn from how I've been living, and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me, making a new creature out of me, and helping me live for you and with you for this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) Heaven's rejoicing. I think we ought to also. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, if you went to heaven and you looked for a file with your name on it, and you looked and you opened the drawer or opened the computer file or however it's listed, because the the Bible says your name's written there. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're in it. Your name is in it. We used to sing, my name is written in glory. (laughs) Hallelujah. If you look for all the dastardly deeds you ever did, all the record of that, I want you to understand, you won't find them. Because God's wiped them out. He's wiped them out. He said he's never going to remind you of them again. So just forget them. Let them be gone. If there's people you need to reconcile with, do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But don't live in any condemnation over the past. Oh, hallelujah. Love y'all. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a couple things that I would like you to do. Hit the subscribe button, rate, and review the podcast. And if you'd like to invest in helping us reach more people for Christ, head over to mywordoflife.church and click the online giving button. Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you again next time.